and mute myself and Robbie wait just about 30 seconds okay oops wait wait I'm not I'm in the wrong thing hold on guys hold on I need to be in this one okay I'm going to mute myself and we'll wait about but in about 15 seconds we'll uh, let them in Oh my goodness, here we are again today, and it's my favorite subject, Peregrine Falcons. Can't wait to hear Steve Schubert talk about that. Welcome everybody to the Flying by the Seat of Your Pants Morro Bay Bird Festival Zoom events. And we've got a couple of dozen of these over, the, uh, over several days, and I am really glad you're here with us. Uh, hey, uh, so we don't spend a lot of time. I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one is we will be recording this video as most of them, and we will make them available when uh, we get our act together sometime after, after this festival. And we'll try to make them available either on Vimeo or on the Bird Festival website. Speaking of the Bird Festival website, <clears throat> that's, a <clears throat> that's a great place to go if you would like to make a donation. All these events are free, and uh, we hope that you invite all your friends. But if you're able and would like to see an in-person festival next year, we need to make up some losses from this year. And anything that you can give would be great. You can do it on the website. You can do it several different ways. Uh, but hopefully, you can make a little donation. If, even if it's a couple bucks, that would be great. So uh, we will be. Uh, asking you to ask some questions through the chat, but we may or may not have time to go through those questions. So we won't open that chat room until later on in the presentation. When we do, write yourself a question and, and we will get it to the right people. Uh, if we have time, we'll answer it live. If we don't, we'll get back to you another way. So questions on chat later on. Okay, now Steve Schubert, I've known him for a while, but let me see if there's anything nice I can say about him. Let me see if there's any paper. Oh, here's the nice paper about Steve Schubert. Let's see, it says, he's an active member of the Morro Coast Audubon Society and the author of the book called The Peregrine Falcons of Morro Rock, A 50-Year History. He's done some amazing work on the High Mountain Condor Lookout Project. And though he's officially retired, he still teaches environmental education, both to elementary kids online uh, but he also teaches natural history courses to big people and adults through the Quest to College programs. And he's been a speaker and a field trip leader for the Winter Bird First Bird Festival. Do you know for how long? Every single one. There's not many people who've done that, but he has been to every single blasted bird festival that Morro Bay uh, uh, we have put on. So we are really, really glad to have him here. Uh, Steve, that's enough blah blah. Take it away and talk to us about the uh, Peregrine Falcons of Morro Rock. Thank you, Chris. The way you introduced me, you said you wouldn't embarrass me, but 25 years means I also got a lot older, didn't I, <laughs> since this <laughs> festival began. So thank you for that. I want to thank you all for joining in. A real quick introduction and I'll start my program in one minute. Um, I am a Central Coast resident, but I've been nearly two years residing in the Pacific Northwest, north of Spokane, Washington, because I had a seasonal home on some forested acreage, and I decided to shelter here during that pandemic. So someday I'll return back home to California, but I'm speaking to you right now from uh, the mountains, looking at about two feet of snow in my yard, flock of wild turkeys at my bird feeders. I'd go chase them away right now, but I'm otherwise occupied with all of you, and that's a good thing. So uh, I do have pretty poor internet service up here in my rural area. So I know I do have an audio or video delay. You may occasionally notice my video get a little choppy or my audio not perfectly synced. But once I start the program, it should hopefully go just fine. And with that, I'm going to get started. 
Um, I'm going to be talking fairly quickly because I'm condensing what would have been an hour talk in an in-person event to a 40 minute talk. So I'm going to go quick as possible and I know I can get through it, but I'm going to have to pace myself here. And my goal today is to present an overview of the, uh, the biology and the, the natural history of this critter, give you some background, and then talk specifically about a lot of years of intense hands-on management over the years that helped to uh, bring back a species from near extinction. So quick overview, peregrine falcons are known as raptors or birds of prey. We're familiar with hawks, eagles, for example. They share a number of morphological characters in common. The sharp hooked beak tears flesh of their prey. Uh, at the end of the toes are long, sharp talons, another obvious characteristic of birds of prey and raptors. And amazing stereoscopic or depth of field vision with the eyes forward facing on their face as in humans, amazing visual acuity. Peregrines, trained peregrines in particular, have been known to respond at moving structures or items in their field of vision at least a mile away, and they can detect that motion. Among all the raptors, falcon silhouettes are quite characteristic with relatively narrow, long pointed, long tails and narrow pointed wings built for speed. In fact, Peregrines have the reputation of being the fastest bird in the world and probably the fastest moving animal on the planet when they go into their diving attacks from higher altitudes and dive down towards their prey, known as a stoop, pulling in their wings after a few flaps and becoming a streamlined bullet. They have been recorded at diving speeds of over 200 miles per hour. So we're going to go back and review some quick high school biology and classify their position in the uh, classification hierarchy. So I challenge all of you, of course, we're going to take a test at the end of this talk. Can you recall the seven levels of classification, starting with the larger groupings and then subdividing them, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, how am I going to remember that? So all animal and plant life generally can be classified in these categories. And falcons and birds in general are animals. Subdivide that into the phylum chordata, which are in general the vertebrates, animals with backbones. And then of all the vertebrates, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds, class Aves represents strictly the 10,000 plus species of birds on planet Earth. But of all the birds in the class Aves, we break them down into subdivisions known as orders. So there are the nocturnal birds of prey, the strigiforms, which are the owls. And we subdivide the orders into families. Of course, you're all going to get tested on all of this today, correct? Might raise your anxiety level a little bit here. Now notice among the diurnal or daytime active uh, raptors, we have a number of families that are recognized. And I want to point out the family Falconidae, which are the true falcons and their close relatives, the Caracaras or Caracaras. And I could go on and on about this taxonomy because it's so fascinating and it's in big flux in recent years. For example, new world vultures like turkey vultures and condors classically have been referred to as true raptors. But recent years of molecular analysis of DNA and and anatomy and behavioral studies suggest that condors, in fact, might be more closely related to storks and other long-legged waders. So this whole taxonomy that I learned, for example, in my college years, is in big flux in recent years. And in fact, I want to point out in just a minute, and I'm finally, uh, peregrines, their binomial or scientific name, Falco peregrinus, translates to the wandering falcon. For example, some peregrine populations migrate from the Arctic to the tropics in South America. So peregrination means to wander, the wandering falcon. But here's an example of how even falcon taxonomy is in transition in recent years. Here's the classical classification. In this case, falcons would be regarded as true birds of prey in their own family, but recent 
Again, DNA analysis in particular, studying the genome of birds in general, suggest that falcons are not necessarily true birds of prey and may in fact not be closely evolutionarily related to hawks and eagles. They are aligned with parrots. And that is an amazing uh, revision of taxonomy uh, to suggest that Falcons are probably more closely related through their DNA, genetics, and evolutionary history to parrots and, and general passerine birds than they are to two, true birds of prey. All right, there's your review of taxonomy. And I want to go back and remind you how to remember those seven label, uh, levels of classification. If you recall, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Here's a quick memory device. Keep pots clean or family gets sick. Let's see who can pass the test at the end of the show here. So now I'm gonna focus back on peregrines in particular for the rest of this talk. They are in particular, not just raptors or birds of prey, but they have some unique characteristics common to other falcons, including a notch on the upper mandible here known as the falcon tooth or tomio tooth. And this predator, although it strikes and usually kills with its feet, with a blow in the air with its feet, if its prey has not died quickly, it can be retrieved in midair or from the ground and quickly dispatched with a bite through the neck. And that tomio tooth can uh, sever the spinal cord of its prey and quickly dispatch its prey. Falcons are also known for the mustachial or malar stripe below the eye that can be developed to small or large degrees depending on species studies suggest that this functions very similar to humans wearing sunglasses and reduces the glare of the sun of this aerial predator hunting in the sky interesting adaptation here's a juvenile peregrine taking off with its prey item what's left of a marbled godwit after being consumed peregrines tend to be bird specialists they may there are always exceptions and there are observations of peregrines that have hunted for bats, for example, or even small mammals and reptiles, but generally they specialize on catching birds. This is a photograph. In fact, Carol Camo, I believe, might be joining us on this session today. She was an elementary school teacher and photographed this on her very own playground in Baywood Park, and the school kids got to come out and watch a peregrine feeding on its prey right there on the school campus. So there you go, bird predators. One of the nicknames for the American peregrine falcon is the duck hawk. And this is an example of why it's called the duck hawk. So there has been association between humans and falcons for several millennia, including prized as a favorite bird among falconers. I won't go into this very much with elaboration, but I want to remind you that our own Chris Cameron is giving this talk tomorrow, Saturday at 12 noon. He'll go far more into the details of falconry and a lot of its um, human interactions that have played with this species that go back long ago. For example, the Egyptian god Horus was the falcon god. My talk today will feature the role of falconers that have helped recover an endangered species from near extinction because falconry techniques have definitely been applied to the management program that helped uh, rescue a highly imperiled species. This happens to be a falconer at the Cold Canyon landfill in San Luis Obispo hired to use falconry birds and peregrines have been used for the same purpose to harass and, and display some of the, the um, nuisance birds, for example, gulls at the landfill. They've been used at airport landing strips also to chase away flocks of birds that potentially could cause strikes at, uh, uh, with planes. So that's the positive aspect of falconry. And I'll elaborate a little more on that as we go into this talk. So we do have several local species of uh, falcons. Most of you are familiar with the smallest North American species, the American kestrel striking um, in plumage and often not even recognized as being a true raptor because they're so approachable and often right along the roadsides and people drive by and say, oh, there's a robin perched on the line, but 
It is a very common small falcon. A rare winter vis visitor to California is the Merlin. This bird tends to nest much further to the north, even up into the boreal forest. A close relative of the peregrine is the prairie falcon, similar in size, lighter coloration. They have the dark black armpits or axillary feathers. So close relative to the peregrine. Young falcon chicks or young raptors in general in the nest are not just always called chicks, they're iases. And this is the same photograph of those three iases only two weeks later that I took in a nest to show how quickly they feathered out before fledging. And when falcons do fledge, there's often um, quite a bit of dimorphism or size difference between siblings and adults because in general, many among many species of raptors, the female tends to be about one third larger in size. And the male is about one third smaller. The adult male, also known as the tearsel or tearsel, is not only smaller, but during the breeding season in particular, can be recognized by the very bright skin coloration around the nostril, the sear and the orbital ring and the feet tend to really brighten up during breeding season. So when you have them side by side, you can sometimes sex them by size and to some degree by the, the coloration of that skin. So there are a number of subspecies of peregrines recognized in the world. This is one of the world's most widespread bird species like the barn owl found on all continents except Antarctica. At least 19 subspecies of peregrines are recognized, and in North America, three in particular. The American peregrine falcon and notums are the local, re generally resident, not highly migratory uh, subspecies found in the majority of our continent. To the north, up into the Arctic tundra, the tundra peregrine migrates all the way deep into Central and South America. Oh, amazing migration between wintering and breeding grounds. And then up in the Pacific Northwest, up into the Aleutian Islands is the Peel's peregrine. Well, let's talk about some of their habitat preferences. Their nesting sites tend to be on high vertical escarpments, including the world's highest cliff, El Capitan in Yosemite. They often tend to nest near a body of water. In this case, the Merced River flows through Yosemite Valley, or they can nest near bodies of water such as lakes, rivers, and ocean, but they do prefer these high rocky escarpments. Their nest site is also known as the eyrie. Peregrines, by the way, don't tend to build a nest site with material like twigs or seaweed. They may occupy occasionally an abandoned nest like a seagull nest, but they tend to simply scrape out a hollow depression in the substrate called the scrape and lay their eggs right on a flat ledge, either out on the exposed ledge or deep within a cave or pothole. And so we know this as the falcon's eyrie or nest site. Locally along the central coast of California, here's some examples of nesting habitat, even though there's a lot of development. Here's an old photo and a more recent photo with all the resort development. There is a nesting site on these cliffs in the Shell Beach area to the south of Avila Beach in Port San Luis, for the example. And this is a good example of classic nesting habitat. In this case, they do tolerate quite a bit of human presence, as you can imagine. A little to the north is Diablo Cove at Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant. And this little islet or sea stack is a historical nesting site that's had monitoring for many years. I've seen fledglings learning to fly, flying along this vertical wall at the power plant, and I suspect onshore winds get deflected up and provide them a little extra lift when they're developing their flying skills, just like natural cliffs would do. Further north up the coast, also on PG&E property, is now the Point Bouchon Trail that's open to public access. And this is the only, to my claim to fame, nest site that I helped to discover some years ago with a local Cal Poly professor, John Edmonston, we discovered this nesting site. Here's the adults and some recent fledglings right along those bluffs. And to the credit of PG&E, during their nesting season, they do route this trail away from the immediate coast to help reduce human disturbance. So this is the Point Bouchon uh, nesting area. I also am curious, for those who know Montana Darrow State Park, 
that these bluffs with these potholes, and in particular this one here in recent years, often has visitation by peregrines. So any of you who like to hike out there on the bluffs trail, uh, keep an eye out. Someday I suspect there may be a new nest site set up in this area. And then, of course, today's focus is going to be on famous Morro Rock. That's the falcon eye view looking down at the parking lot below. North of uh, Morro Rock, and I'm going to wrap this part up quickly here and focus on Morro Rock itself, is the Pierre des Blancas Light Station. And a lot of you who are locals know that you can go on public tours. Maybe this will be post-pandemic. I'm not sure when they'll resume. But that, again, another islet right next to the uh, lighthouse is a well-known peregrine falcon eyrie nest site. There it is, perched right on the edge of that pothole among all the guano of all the cormorants and other seabirds. And then the spectacular Big Sur coast on Highway 1 is a magnet for nesting peregrine falcons. High vertical escarpments near a body of water, good hunting, nesting habitat. Those, again, who know the area, there are other moros lined up with Moro Rock. We, these are ancient volcanic peaks or necks, and historically there have been other peregrine nest sites on several of these moros, including presently Hollister Peak, and then right at the town of San Luis Obispo is Bishop Peak, and that was once a historic nesting site. So as time goes by, they seem to be recolonizing some of these old sites as their population recovers. So I want to briefly explain how I got so involved with all of this. Long ago when I was a graduate student at Cal Poly, I took some time off from academic work and was hired to hike down from this spectacular fire lookout down into the Santa Lucia wilderness area. And these spectacular cliffs down below were historic California condor nesting cliffs this chick was photographed in the nest in San Luis Obispo County, Central Coast area in 1969, and that was the last time there was any known nesting on these cliffs until 50 years later they returned to near the San Simeon release site and are now once again nesting in the San Luis Obispo County area. But uh, these particular cliffs have been vacant for, of condors now for over 50 years and we hope they find their way back. So my involvement with this area was that it was also a nest site for the highly imperiled, imperiled peregrine falcon in the 1970s when there were only a few known nesting pairs left within the entire state. So this species too, like the condor in recent years, was highly imperiled and their population was crashing all over the world. So local members of Morro Coast Audubon Society developed an agreement with the U.S. Forest Service to staff the fire lookout during nesting season. Here's the original letter written to the Forest Service proposing this project, and volunteers would monitor from a distance the nesting activities of this highly imperiled endangered species from the lookout. And I, in my possession today, have their original calendar, their scheduled shifts, their field notes, and eventually I came on as a hired seasonal biologist and was camped out down below, below their nesting cliffs. And our job was to monitor this uh, nest site and protect it in particular from human disturbance factors. In fact, this whole area was closed off to, to access during the nesting season. My working, working partner was a, and is a renowned artist, John Schmidt, who uh, is working right here on site. And I have this drawing hanging right here in this room on, framed on my wall as I speak to all of you. John was also, and is a, a very well-known taxidermist. This is the taxidermy specimen of a condor that's on display at the uh, Goodwin Education Center on the Carrizo Plain. He's also a contributing artist to the National Geographic Field Guide to Birds. So I just was lucky to have a working partner who was also a mentor and an inspiration to me. And these are some of his line, his uh, ink and line drawings that he produced while we were on duty that year, that late 1970s. So that's how I got involved with Peregrine Falcon monitoring and research. All these years later, I still try and go back into this area. 
just more for fun and volunteering. We still try and document the presence and activity of nesting peregrines. And the time came where we were at that old lookout that had been abandoned and vandalized for about 20 years and we restored it as a functioning research station. And this is a whole nother talk. So I won't elaborate, but we restored the con the lookout is also a condor monitoring site with volunteers and Cal Poly student interns. So that's a whole different talk regarding the California condor uh, recovery program. So I'm going to finish this talk by focusing now on the some spectacular events and history that have taken place at this renowned nesting site. Morro Rock is probably one of the most famous peregrine nesting sites in all of North America because it's so accessible to the public and tourists and local residents for many, many years have had their very first encounters and visual sightings. And there are folks on site that can interact with you and give you information. So it's just a remarkable place to go out and view them, unless they're on the ocean facing side of the rock. And they have been known to nest on in some years where they're very difficult to observe if you're not out on the rock jetty or out on a boat. But, and here's an old photograph of a peregrine on a ledge on the ocean facing side of Morro Rock. But fortunately for most of the last 20 some years, they have nested in more accessible locations where you could park down below in the parking lot, look up at these nesting potholes, for example, and you will find often peregrine presence. Some of these streaks, by the the way are not just mineral stains, but some of this is guano or bird droppings. And this is one way to search for raptors is look for the whitewash on the rocks that might indicate the presence of a raptor. In particular, many years they have nested in this pothole and it has this protrusion of rock at the edge that they perch on. And in the early 90s, I think I just drew to mind that that looks like a diving board. So now we call this the diving board irie. This is a photograph of that irie. Here's the diving board. Sorry, these are really old 35 millimeter slides. I didn't take these photos, but it does photo document that maybe for generations, if not centuries, some of these same nesting holes have attracted many, many different nesting pairs over the years. This photograph was taken in the diving board irie in the early 1970s. And they were nesting in the same hole last year and fledged a youngster out of this same nest hole. So here we have a pair of adults, one perched on the diving board. They have another, a number of other favorite perches. Here's some whitewash to indicate frequent activity. This happens to be the throne where a pair are perched in the shade, relaxing, resting. This is the top of the chimney that has been nicknamed for one of their favorite perches. And this shadowy perch site here, here's a fuzzy photo beneath the shaded overhang is another place we often search for them when they're not out hunting. They rest, they preen, they sleep, until it's time to go out on a hunt and then they're on their way. One of their ever their favorite perch sites, believe it or not, is the old power plant situated on the edge of the estuary. And that is one of their favorite perching sites. So when you're go going by the power stacks, it's always a good place to park, look up, get, get out your binoculars and you may find them, especially on this railing or near the summit of the stacks one of their favorite perch sites and probably a hunting site as well. So here it is January and that is also the beginning of the season when they begin to show interest, even though they tend to mate for life um, and they are monogamous in general, there's always exceptions, but they will begin copulating as early as the month of January, but they don't tend to lay eggs until March and April during the beginning of the spring season. Here's another old photograph of three to four eggs that tend to be their clutch size laid on a ledge, but these flat ledges are crucial to help prevent those eggs from just rolling over and falling off the edge. So that's why they prevent, uh, prefer flat surfaces, either out on a ledge or deep within a cave or pothole. Beautifully blotched colored eggs. 
Here's another example of a scrape. Notice there's no nesting material used to, to uh, deposit their eggs. Both male and female incubate over an average 33 day period. And also during the height of nesting season, the male or tirso tends to be the provider hunting for prey, bringing a food item back into the nest or to the cliffside. And here's a spectacular food exchange where the female, when she hears the male's vocalizations, will leave the nest site, follow the male, and in midair, retrieve that prey item from her mate, returning to the nest site and feeding the young in the nest. So here's a much better photo of a food exchange. Sometimes it's beak to beak. It can be feet to feet or beak to feet. And if the female drops that prey and it's an accidental food exchange, she can still maneuver through the air and usually retrieve that before it strikes the ground and then take it to the nest to feed the young. So as time goes by and the young get older in the nest, both male and female will start hunting for their young and bring that prey back to the nest and just drop it off. Um, as the young get older with their ravenous appetites, they may have some sibling rivalry among themselves, fight among themselves for some prey. But as time goes by, the parents will simply drop it off in the nest and they will begin feeding themselves. So speaking of nestlings, I want to show this. Here's a few nestlings on the diving board watching an incoming adult bringing prey. And you can see they're hungry, they're begging, they're, they're very agitated and excited to see food being brought into the nest. So here's a photo of a nestling that hasn't fledged yet. And I wanna give you another nickname for peregrines besides duck hawk. Sometimes they're called the big footed hawk. And look at those disproportionately large feet, huge feet. Well, those are their striking weapons. When they dive at their prey in a stoop at over hundred miles per hour, they will strike with clenched feet and that in, that momentum alone is often enough to dispatch their prey in a pluff, fluff of feathers. And uh, that's how they got their nickname, the big footed hawk. So fledgling is a perilous time in any young bird's life. Peregrines tend to fledge at about six weeks of age, about 42 days old. When they do successfully fledge, if they don't have accidents and break a ring, uh, break a wing or fall down the escarpment, those that survive those initial perilous days begin to develop their flying skills quite rapidly. Here's a couple siblings playing in the air with chasing each other. Even within days, they begin chasing other things, even butterflies or large birds. I've seen them chasing great blue herons soon out of the nest just to develop those flying skills. If they can make it through their first year, they may have a lifespan 10, 15 years or more. 15 year old bird is an old bird. Some are known to live 20 years or older. And again, here are parents still procuring food for their young, even when they're out of the nest for a period of days to weeks, they will still provide food. The young are furiously chasing their parents, sometimes dropped in the air or they'll follow them to the rock where they'll drop it off on, on an outcrop. But eventually those young develop their own hunting skills. And in fact, as time passes, usually by the end of summer and early fall, those young peregrines will have dispersed away from their natal area. The adults can become so territorial, they will eventually chase their own young away from the rock. So the young, as they mature, will have to find their own nesting territories. So here's a junk youngster in the air showing that they often have a very distinct white tail band in their early juvenile plumages. Speaking of that, here are juvenile peregrines soon out of the nest. And I wanna point out that they have striking vertical striations, but as they reach, reach, uh, reach adulthood, here's an adult one year later, the exact same bird. So I'm gonna back up again and show you juvenile plumage. In fact, the yellowish skin tends to be actually more bluish. This photo doesn't show it very well, but kind of tends to be here. I'll go back. The, the uh, sear around the nostrils and the eye orbits and tend to be more of a bluish versus a yellowish cast. 
And then, as I mentioned, vertical streaking becomes horizontal barring in the adult, and that skin becomes more yellowish in, in uh, color. So they are highly territorial during nesting season. This one's on the tail of a Western gull, but they'll chase anything that they find an intrusion in their nesting territory, including larger birds, eagles, hawks, even turkey vultures can be quite maneuverable when they have a falcon giving them a thump with their feet. So I'm gonna use my phone real quick. I have a, a Merlin app. If you're familiar with the birding app, Merlin, it's free. And I'm just gonna play an angry peregrine falcon. This is This is called cacking, cacking, cack, 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 cack. When you hear that, that usually means look up. You may see an agitated falcon on the chase. That's often a way to get a visual sighting of peregrines is listen. And they're also sweeping the cliff sides called cliff racing back and forth, sweeping away potential predators or intruders. So that includes humans. The, you know, they're tolerant of humans down below in the parking lot, but don't climb up to the summit. You may find talons embedded in your skull. They've even been known to attack feral cats. There have been, unfortunately, in years past, high cat populations at Morro Rock that in recent years have been removed, but uh, they've been even known to attack and kill cats that were too close to the nest site. So this was the 2001 Winter Bird Festival field trip that I was leading. And uh, we took our group out and we found a peregrine perched in this pothole. And I was shocked and surprised because this was on the north side of Morro Rock where we hadn't noticed peregrine activity before. And it was that very year it was determined there wasn't one pair of falcons nesting on Morro Rock, there were two pairs. And this was a remarkable find, and to some credit, due to the bird festival, because now for the past 20 years, there have been two pairs of peregrine falcons nesting in close proximity. And there are very few places on the entire continent of North America where it's been documented that they do nest in such close proximity. So that hole has now been named the cathedral, and last year they fledged four young out of this very same nest nesting site or eyrie. All right, well, I'm going to start wrapping up the talk as I only have a few minutes to go anyway. And I wanted to highlight some of the reasons peregrines became so highly endangered and what helped bring them back with a highly um, uh, involved management system. There are many reasons populations can plummet over time, but it's not due to example there were examples of egg collecting and poaching and hunting. And yes, falconers did prize this bird. And when it wasn't legal after it declared an endangered species, there were concerns about certain nest sites like Morro Rock where poachers could potentially rob the nest of their young. But those were not the major reasons for the population decline all over the world. It was an ingestion of a pesticide, DDT, in the food chain that biologically magnified from, from um, for example, birds feeding on insects. Insects had fed on crop plants that had been sprayed with pesticides. It moved right up the food chain to the top of the food chain. Peregrines ingesting poison prey would also ingest DDT in particular, and this caused the female to be unable to lay healthy, normally thick eggshells. DDT contamination causes eggshell thinning. And these eggs were now very fragile. The embryos could dehydrate from just losing moisture through the eggshells, but they also could die from simply being crushed by the weight of the incubating adults. So this was probably the most important reason for the worldwide collapse. This shows a National Geographic magazine article about the Morro Rock Falcons. And at the time, that was the highest level of DDT contamination ever recorded in a peregrine falcon when this article was published. So pesticide contamination and uh, exposure to other potential contaminants, including PCPs, PCBs, for example, this all led to the establishment of the Peregrine Fund in the year 1970, originally founded at Cornell University by Dr. Tom Cade, 
a professor there. Then it expanded to the West and is now centered at the Peregrine Fund World Center Bird of Prey Center in Boise, Idaho. But it also had an arm of the Peregrine Fund established at UC Santa Cruz known as the Predatory Bird Research Group. In the late 70s, this got started where climbers would enter the nests, remove fragile thin eggs. This is eggs being removed from the Morro Rock Irie trying to prevent them from being crushed by their incubating parents, hatching them in captivity. And these fragile eggs, if they didn't uh, break just by being handled, and that here they are being brought down in special carrier cases, would be hatched in captivity and young nestlings at about the age of 10 days old, when downy chicks could be reintroduced back to the wild. And this is known as fostering. I was fortunate to help carry climbing gear on two occasions so i took some of these photos young are introduced in the nest known as fostering some of these young originated from captive breeding including this site at uc santa cruz that was developed in the late 70s and a breeding stock of captive birds would be bred in captivity to help produce these young chicks that could be reintroduced and here's another positive aspect of falconers they often donated their own personal birds to the captive breeding program, being that peregrines have become so rare in the wild to begin with. So falconers and their techniques with captive breeding helped to get this program going. Here's a, a bird, chicks being fed with a falcon puppet to help them prevent being preventing imprinting on humans so that they'll hopefully grow up wild and not associate humans as friendly critters. So a lot of this took place at Morro Rock. Here's uh, the coordinator of the Santa Cruz project with actor Farrow, Bill Farrow from the MASH TV series. They were filming a TV commercial for Fish and Game to raise funds for endangered species. The very first chicks ever introduced into California were fostered in Morro Rock. These two chicks were hatched at Cornell University, New York, flown by commercial airline and fostered into the Morro Rock site. Um, unfortunately, that very same year, one of these chicks died and one of the adults died from a shotgun blast. And here's an x-ray showing lead pellets. Well, that particular year, the Ned nest guard Merlin imitated the male's food exchange calls and Merlin, who was perched on top of Morro Rock, became a surrogate parent and threw pigeons off Morro Rock for the female to catch and feed her remaining young. This young nestling, which had been leg banded, by the way, was found a year later dead in Southern California, but it did show how far they can disperse after nesting. So this nest banding program is important. We've had Morro Rock chicks, for example, become breeders in uh, Big Sur, 100 miles to the north, We've also had peregrines banded that showed up from as far away as the Channel Islands and became nesters at Morro Rock. So the bird banding program was really helpful for monitoring all of this. All right, with just a few minutes to go, I'm gonna to have to speed race through all this to finish up my talk here. Um, and we'll finish in present day. So all this intensive hands-on management helped recover a population in 1970, there were only two known nesting pairs in all of California. And finally, with all these years of intensive hands-on management, there are now well over 200 active nesting sites. This bird has been removed from the endangered species list. In the east, where they had actually become extinct, they used a, a program called uh, hack boxes to release peregrines back in the wild, and now they've been reintroduced into the east where they actually became extinct as a nesting species. One year, one of the falcons was found with an injured wing. She was not able to be returned to the wild. Some school kids had found her injured. So she, this shows how falconers again, using falconry techniques, if the bird can be rehabilitated, can be released back to the wild. This is our own Jerry Roberts who uh, is with Pacific Wildlife Care, and she's shown up for some of my in-person talk in past bird festival events. And then finally, I'm gonna show that uh, besides this history that I just can't quite finish up in my allotted time. So I'm gonna encourage any of you that would like to learn more about the history of Morro Rock to check in with the 
Well, you can see I'm just flashing through it now. This is the part I wasn't able to finish with. Uh, there's been a lot of media publicity, a lot of educational experiences for school kids on field trips and photographic opportunities in recent years. I encourage you to, to check out, if you're visiting Moral Rock, the Peregrine Coast Peregrine Watch with Bob Eisenberg. He would love to point out the Falcons for you, tell you what's going on. And I'm gonna wrap this up in one minute. You can find one of our nesting pairs on the north side. She's actually leg banded and her name is Sierra. She was banded, she'll be 10 years old this year. She is now one of the nesting peregrines on Moro Rock. Um, fascinating that we still have two su successful nesting pairs. Peregrines are so adaptable that they've also become nesters in our cities on high rise buildings and you can often watch them on live webcams. So with that, I want to uh, let you all know that I documented all of this history with a publication. You can find it on Amazon.com, both paperback and Kindle readers. And if this interests you, it'll help you catch up with all that I didn't have time to go into more details with today. And also I'm teaching a bird of prey class for you local residents and it's gone virtual through Quest to College Community Programs. I am offering a Raptor ID course and virtual field trip in February. So for any of you that are interested, I encourage you to check that out, Quest to College Community Programs. This is a one and a half hour session online and it's a $15 registration fee. So whew, ran out of time. Wow, Steve, you did it. I can't <laughs> believe it. Um, uh, you, you ran through a lot of falconry info in, uh, in, in, in a short time. Well, we really appreciate your expertise, let alone your years and years of dedication to the birds. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed by you. And Thank you, know, you all. I, I have one of your books that's, that, um, that's that's signed and it's a, it's a treasure for me. So if you don't have that book, check it out on Amazon. You could probably even get it at the uh, Morro Bay State Park uh, gift store. I'm I'm not sure if it's still there or not. Um, uh, uh, we would like to say, let's see, um, Bob. I think I think the uh, the the fellow who hangs out at the Rock, Bob, is on the line. Bob, are you here? And Heather, Bob and Heather, yes. Bob hey and guys. Heather, um, uh, you know what? If you want to learn a little bit more, if Steve talked too fast, go on down to uh, Mora Rock and, and Bob and Heather will, will fill you in on all the gaps. Uh, it was nice to see some, uh, some old familiar faces in the show. Uh, Merlin, who has passed on, but Merlin uh, was there. And Dean Thompson, I think I, sh I saw a picture of Dean Thompson, uh, who is also one of our one of our leaders. So uh, thank you, Steve. Again, we Dean really- is, Dean is a big part of that story. Read the book. You'll find Dean in the book. <laughs> yeah. and, and you'll find yeah, Dean- Sorry in I ran out of time. I, I really did cut it short and I didn't cut it short enough. So I just ran out of time there, but hopefully I got the, the main points across. So I wanna thank you all for inviting me to be a speaker. My 25th year, I made it. Virtually, <laughs> I made it. Good job, Steve. Thank you very much. So. As we put up this uh, final slide, this final slide uh, uh, tells you uh, that if you have the ability and want to make a donation and you're one of those cool kids with one of those smartphones, you can make a donation by Venmo or by PayPal by uh, looking at the, uh, by, by putting those little QR codes in your screen and making a donation. That'll help us get an in-person festival off the ground next year. Um, uh, again, if you want to contact Steve or any of the speakers, uh, just uh, contact us at that name that's on the screen. It says support at morrowbaybirdfestival.org and, and we'll get in touch with you. Uh, coming up, uh, we are going to be uh, closing this down in just a minute. And if you want to come to the next one, just come back in 10 minutes at the top of the hour. We always need to do a little bit of uh, internal work to shut one down and start a new one up. Uh, but uh, up next is Brian Sullivan who is gonna be talking about the cutting edge of bird science. I can't wait for that. And then our keynote speaker tonight is uh, John Muir Laws. And I think he's been in on some of these things today. So he will know uh, what's happening and, and looking forward to that. So Brian Sullivan, Sullivan is up next at four o'clock. Uh, thanks everybody for coming.
we're going to close down this show. Come right on back, and we'll see you in about 10 minutes, okay? Uh, just uh, leave this one and enter again in about 10 minutes. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>